verses, Psalm 40. And this psalm is interesting because it's, it's amidst a group of psalms that over, starting in about Psalm 37 to uh, 40, to the end of 41, it records David's, it's kind of this, this uh, track record of psalms that record David's uh, requests and pleas for deliverance from suffering due to multiple things that are going on in his life, wars, uh, his own personal sin, things like that. Psalm, you know, we see in Psalm 38, 12, it says, those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. And then if you skip over to Psalm 39, verse 8, he will say, deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. But where we land today in Psalm 40, we actually see David make a pretty sharp shift. So we've seen David be beginning to just make all of these pleas and, and ask all of these questions of God. But in Psalm 40, he begins to, to highlight something. He hi begins to highlight the importance of deliverance. The fact that God, in his faithfulness, will deliver him. But he also begins to emphasize the importance of waiting for the Lord. And so today, the attribute that we're going to talk about of God is God's faithfulness. And I want to do that through three parts. Thanksgiving, lament, Messiah. Thanksgiving, lament, and Messiah. So that's where we're going this morning. So first is Thanksgiving. Let's look at Psalm 40, verses 1 through 4. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Verse 4. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. And so David opens Psalm 40 by testifying to the people that in, at least in his life, he was seeing the fruit and answers to his prayers for deliverance after a long time in which he, uh, by most scholar, like by most scholars' opinions, had the only thing that he really had to rely on was the fact that he was waiting. He was in this season of waiting for the Lord to act. We, if you were here for, with us for our series through 1 Samuel, we saw that David experienced numerous betrayals. He experienced being hunted. He experienced wars. He experienced his own personal failures. And many scholars believe that Psalm 40 would have been written at, during what is known, during that kind of period in David's life as he was kind of coming out of that and recounting all that the Lord had done for him as he waited on him. It was also... A lot of scholars will say that it was written during the early monarch period of Israel, under which a lot was going on. So a lot of uh, the nation at that time would have been coming under the kind of this united rule of David. And this was a period that was marked by kind of the consolidation of a lot of the Israelite tribes after they had been scattered, uniting them under a single king. So you have that, but you also have this constant struggles with what would have been the neighboring nations, such as the Philistines and the Moabites and all of these people that were kind of vying for control. And on top of that, you kind of have, you have the establishment of Jerusalem as not only this political kind of center where things were happening, but also the religious center in the life of the people of God during this time. And a big part of that, which we'll get to uh, later in Psalm 40, David will address that, is sacrificial systems and temple worship were kind of becoming, uh, once again, but kind of in different forms, central 
to Pika, to how people practiced and lived out their relationship to God. And so God, so what David is saying is at the, in the opening is that God had at last reestablished him. And in light of that, David had a new song of praise in his mouth for the Lord. And what he's doing in Psalm 40 is trying to encourage the people and renew their confidence in God. And so lots is going on as we kind of wade in to the waters of Psalm 40. But what we see in the opening is the fruit of waiting. Right? We see the fruit of waiting. And, and waiting is nothing new. Even in the midst of, of all of this stuff going on and David trying to encourage the people like, hey, this is what, has, this is what has, has, it has looked like for me to wait on the Lord. I want to encourage you in this season with all this going on. What does that look like for you? And again, waiting is nothing new to the people of God. It's a reoccurring theme throughout the biblical story that reveals both its share of rewards, right, good fruit that is happening, like we're seeing in Psalm 40 with David, but also its challenges. As they and we, in our own stories, have waited, not for if God will be faithful, but how. The question that, that is never on the table for David or us is, man, is God going to be faithful? And it's how is he going to be faithful? If you look back just at a cursory view of the Old Testament, you'll see stories like Abraham and Sarah starting in Genesis 12. They waited for years for the birth of their son Isaac, the son that God himself had promised them. And this waiting over, over years tested their faith and also their patience. But in time, we will we'll see that God did fulfill his promise in his own time. You jump forward to Exodus, and Exodus uh, 1 through Exodus chapters 1 through chapter 14, you see how the Israelites waited for centuries to be freed from slavery. And though that wait was long and filled with things that were just blatantly unfair to them and filled with suffering, God eventually would bring a deliverer through Moses. And even in the New Testament, uh, Simeon and Anna in Luke, these two elderly individuals had waited their whole lives to see the promised Messiah. And their patience was reward, rewarded by getting to actually encounter Jesus as a child. And even in David's own life, many of David's songs speak of waiting on the Lord. Right? David experienced long periods of waiting, whether that was waiting to become king after being anointed, where he continued to just live out his life in his father's fields, knowing and, and in the service of Saul, knowing that this God had this calling on his life. Or it was waiting for deliverance from his enemies. Right? When he went through this 10-year period, roughly 10-year period of, of having to run from Saul and hide in caves and in other city and in other cities. And his waiting is, ca is characterized by trusting God's faithfulness. He had numerous opportunities to kill Saul, and he didn't, because he had this larger uh, lens and way of seeing that was like, no, like God is going to be faithful and work all of these circumstances out that are hard in, their, in his own time. And it's better than if I were to take action in my own hands. And you could say that a crucial part of the Christian life is the ability to wait well. Right? Because waiting is actually an act of faith. And so what I want us to see from the, the opening verses of Psalm 40 is that, it is that it is good to wait on the Lord. Now let me, be, let me clarify something important. Biblically, 
waiting is an active thing, not a passive thing. Right? Now, yes, there are, there are crucial times where you do. You need to sit and you need to wait patiently for the Lord in prayer. But by and large, it is not a passive thing. It's an active thing. It's not merely just waiting for time to pass, but it's actually a process of things like trust and hope and preparation. Right? David models us for that in his own life. We see that uh, in the disciples in the book of Acts. After Jesus' ascension, the disciples were instructed to wait for the coming of the Spirit. And their waiting was characterized by prayer and living in community. Right? So they didn't just like wait around and do nothing. They waited patiently for the Lord and they cried out to him. And even in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus instructs us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's not an invitation to solely pray that and then sit back and just not do anything. That's actually an invitation to partner with God to that very end, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I remember I was, uh, I was sitting at a taco shop a couple years ago in Oklahoma with a friend of mine, and we were going through this very song, just kind of processing through, and like, what does it look like to wait on the Lord? My, my friend was in the process of trying to discern whether or not he wanted to kind of launch off into full-time ministry or if he wanted to pursue uh, music as a full-time career. And, and as we, were, as we were processing that moment together, because I had my own version of that, of like, what, what am I going to do? And as we were kind of both sitting there uh, waiting for our food, but also like waiting for like what the Lord was going to do, uh, we, we kind of came to this conclusion where it was like, we're going to do, kind of live our lives the, the best that we can as we you know, seek to follow Jesus in these like broader things that he feels like. We're call, he's call, we, we feel like he's calling us to do. And we're just going to see what happens. But we are going to be faithful because God has been faithful to us. And that ended up me uh, in that season moving into uh, counseling practice and him moving into actually full-time ministry where uh, he actually got to do both. He got to do music and uh, work for a church. Now, I realized that that, that not all of those stories end like that. They don't always kind of get ironed out and look that great. And so the question, as we kind of uh, jump in to the first couple of verses of Psalm 40, is how do we wait well? How do we wait well? How do we, like David says in verse 4, not turn to the proud or people that go after lies, right? How do we live swimming upstream against what our culture says is normal that is not the way of Jesus and have a new song in our mouths so that people in our culture might see and fear and put their trust in the Lord? Now, just a, a quick side note, the fear of the Lord can be understood in a lot of different ways uh, depending on the context, but by and large, it is not meant to carry a sense of fear or dread on behalf of humanity as they relate to God. Quite the opposite, actually. The fear, when, when David says that many will see and fear the Lord, he's referencing uh, other places where the scriptures will talk about that the fear of the Lord is about maintaining a, a balanced and respectful relationship with God, which actually, according to the broader library of scripture, will lead to wisdom and spiritual growth. Right? And so it's not this like cowering, it's not this like cowering in fear. And so in light of the reality of God's faithfulness uh, being worth proclaiming, right? how do we, how do we live out 
those next couple of verses, like, what is David saying? Well, we'd be, I think, we'd be a witness. Right? We'd be a witness. Let's read verses five, uh, 5 through 10. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an op- but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and of your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. So how does David in Psalm 40 respond and bear the, and tell about the fruit of what it looks like to wait on the Lord? He doesn't keep it to himself. He tells people, All right? Verse five, David grounds what he's about to say in the following verses in the fact that people are loved by God and that his deeds and thoughts toward them are more that can more than can be told. All right, that's verse 5. And he does that because verse 6 is is challenging. Not so much in a offensive way, but as a as actually a prophetic reminder to God's people. Right, as I said, as, as we opened, the sacrificial system, which was established in uh, the law of Moses, was a vital part of worship for the Israelites. This included things like sacrifices and offerings and the temple rituals that were central to their relationship with God. Again, based on what the law that Moses had laid out. And so a statement implying that ultimately God didn't desire these sacrifices could appear at first glance to the people that were reading this. Like, wait a second, do we, do we have to undermine? Are, we tr- are you trying to undermine all of these traditions or say that they don't matter? Because it's, it's important to, to note that the idea of God desiring something deeper than ritual sacrifice was not entirely new or foreign to the Israelite tradition. But as they're kind of coming back together to reestablish certain things, David is, is reminding them, hey, this is actually at, the, at a deep level, not what ultimately what God is desiring. But again, this, this wasn't a new thought for them. Throughout the Old Testament, prophets and other writers had ex- expressed the idea that what God desires deeper than just their uh, actions is actually a heart that is, a, is aligned through things like obedience and humility, right? A heart that is aligned with God's will was more important than mere uh, acts of sacrifice that lacked heart. For example, uh, if you remember back in 1 Samuel 15, it says to obey is better than sacrifice. And David himself in Psalm 51 uh, echoes this sentiment after his kind of his kind of falling out and sin issues with Bathsheba, stating that God desires a broken and contrite heart more than he desires sacrifices. Right? David is is reminding us in the middle of Psalm 40 that and the people that he wrote it to that true worship is not about ritual alone. It's about the internal posture of the heart. Again, a heart that's characterized by obedience and humility and this genuine devotion over the externals of burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the same is true for the rhythms or the rhythms that we do today, right? They're a means to an end, right? The end being a love for God as we receive his love for us. 
David will continue that thought, kind of that thought line in verses 7 through 8. Because God has been so good to David, David can yield his life as a living sacrifice to him, as Paul will say in Romans 12. Let's read verses 7 through 8 again. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. And so as the Lord's anointed king, David was responsible in, in many ways to follow the directions handed down to him. But because God had captured his affections, because he had this deeper desire to move beyond just what was required of him, he wanted, wanted it to come from this internal place. David could say that the law was not only in his heart, but also in his hands. He delighted to do God's will rather than just doing it out of obligation. And the outward expression of that is in verses 9 through 10. When he says, I have told of the glad news of your deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. You know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and of your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. <coughs> David is being a witness. Jesus will pull, Jesus will say, use similar language in Acts when he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so what does it look like to be a witness? What does it look like to model what David is saying of like, man, I haven't, I haven't hidden this. I haven't just stored up all of these things in my heart and in my life that I kind of like sit on this treasure hoard of what does it look like to actually share those things? It in, I think David models it. He says he hasn't hidden these things. He's, it's driven him to action. Right? The word witness means someone who sees or experiences something important for others to know about. Right? It involves the words that we say, but also the things that we do. Now, a lot could be said about what does that look like? What does evangelism look like? Um, what does witnessing look like? And there are, different, there are different ways of that where that is healthy and that is not super healthy. But nonetheless, we are called to be witnesses. Right? The gospel is meant to be spoken but also embodied. Right? Spoken when someone asks questions and living in such a way that people get curious enough to ask questions in the first place. Right? To model what David says of like, I have not hidden these things on, I haven't hidden these things from people, I haven't hidden them from the great congregation. But then comes another reality. What do we do when it's hard to be thankful, right? When the waiting seems like it has no end, when you can't sing a new song because you're trying to keep yourself, <laughs> right, afloat when you want to throw up your hands, when you can't tell about Jesus because you're drowning in your own uncertainties and questions. That leads us to part two, lament. Let's read verses 11 through 15. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. The tempo in 
this psalm changes as David, we kind of see in David, he's overwhelmed by all of these internal and external struggles, right? Verse, we see in verse 13 that he pleads for God's intervention, expressing this urgency, right? And then in verse 14 through 15, he calls for his enemies to be put to shame and defeated, right? He desires justice, asking God to rescue him and vindicate him by humiliating those who wish to do him harm. And I think these, these couple verses say something very important to us. I love that David can be honest with God about what's going on internally while allowing God's faithfulness to align him with, with, with what is actually true so that he doesn't act out of his lament and spread it to where it does harm. And lament is a central theme in the Psalms, and it's meant to express prayers that are directed at God that involve us dealing with sorrow, pain, injustice, and loss. And just like David models for us in these verses, lament is, our, is how we kind of carry our situations and our hearts to God as we wrestle with the pain amidst his promises. Mark wrote, Bogoff, in his book, uh, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, writes, lament is the language of people who believe in God's sovereignty but live in a world with tragedy. He says elsewhere, we complain on the basis of our belief in who God is and what he can do. And that's what David is doing. He's being honest with God about, hey, this is stuff that's going on that I don't like, that I wouldn't wish for, but I trust you. Right, lament is how we as Christians anchor ourselves in the past and future faithfulness of God while we wait for him to act in the present. So what is this leading to? How can we wait well and lament well? How is David modeling that for us? Let's look at verses 16 through 17. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, my God. Part three, Messiah. The word Messiah comes from the, from the, meaning, the Hebrew word meaning anointed one. And it's about this person that will bring about restoration. Enter Jesus. Right? The Messiah is a central theme throughout the Bible of, of God's, God's sending and the people's expectations of a Savior. Right? And his not only his coming, but his return to establish his eternal kingdom. Right? God's faithfulness is seen most clearly in the person of Jesus. A Messiah who doesn't leave us alone in our waiting and lament. And a Messiah who is the fulfillment of all things. And it's one of the things that I found most interesting about this is in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. The writer of Hebrews says this. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. That's Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Sounds familiar, right? Because he's pulling directly from Psalm 40, 6 through 8. Track with me that the author of Hebrews identifies Jesus as the fulfillment of those verses in Psalm 40. Jesus is the is fills in and usurps the insufficiency of sacrifices and the need for a savior who would perfectly obey God's will. Psalm 40 is about Jesus. And so the invitation this morning in light of Psalm 40 is to follow Jesus. It's what it's always been. To follow him through joy and through waiting and through lament, knowing that he will be with you because he is faithful. He is faithful. 